Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. Right now we're in the Aquarium Care and Quarantine Center here at the Houston Zoo where we're keeping the animals that are going to go into our Galapagos exhibit opening up next fall. So come on in. So right now we don't have too many animals in here, but we are going to get more and we have gotten more last week that we're keeping in our other quarantine building. But for now, all we have here is a green sea turtle, three countless rays and two tangs. So in this tank that you can see right now, we're going to, we're, we have a green sea turtle, which we're going to be feeding right now, just so you can see it up close. And hopefully it'll come over soon. So our green sea turtle, we actually got because it came in injured and unable to survive in the wild, the way we get a lot of the sea turtles that come in at the Houston Zoo. So we actually had this sea turtle for, I think, just over two years now. And the reason why we still have it here instead of releasing it like we normally do with sea turtles is because it had an issue with floating up with its butt up sticking out of the water. And sometimes it would sleep like that, which is really not a good thing to do because it could get hit by boats and then we'd either get it in again or we just never see it again, which is not something that we want. So our vets made sure to check up on it every now and then to make sure it's recovering from this process. And actually, it just got cleared for a release recently, so we're going to be releasing it in a couple of days, and hopefully it'll be able to survive and thrive in the wild. So normally when we get sea turtles in, they go through our, a different sea turtle department that works in conjunction with the vets to help bring them in, but since this was a bit more of like a long-term issue, they decided to have it here with us, and we actually had it in our old aquarium building, which was demolished a couple months ago, and then we moved it to our quarantine building, and then we moved it over here where it's been for the past couple of months and it seems to be liking its new bigger tank. So what we normally feed our animals, which I tried feeding a little while ago is capelin. It's a small type of fish. We sometimes feed it shrimp or squid or other types of seafood, but we also supplement it with lettuce or other sorts of produce just so it gets a bit of a balanced diet. So juvenile sea turtles are actually omnivorous, which means that they eat meat and they eat plants, pretty much whatever they can find. They also eat jellyfish, which I'm sure you've heard that some sea turtles eat. But as they get older, they start eating less and less meat and eventually the green sea turtle adults, once they're fully mature, they become completely herbivorous. So this one that you're seeing right now, even though it is pretty big, it's actually not that much older than like a juvenile. When we had it in our aquarium building, it was much smaller than it, so it's still grown, but it's still definitely not old enough to be considered a mature at all. So I'm gonna be tossing in a head of lettuce right now, just so you can see it eating it. It normally just picks it out off the surface. It could take the whole head, it just chomps on it throughout the day, and it leaves quite a bit of a mess, but that's animals. So I don't know if you were able to pick up the little sound, but when it came up from the water, it sort of let out this hissing sound. So the thing about sea turtles is they actually have a really weird way of breeding where once they get to the surface, they, have, they let out an explosive breath and then quickly suck in air. And that way it can get in a bunch of air into its lungs so it can stay down under the water longer because they're not like fish where they just breathe water. They're more closer to us land animals, just like regular land turtles where they have proper lungs. So every now and then they need to come up to the air to breathe. So that's actually one of the issues that we're having with sea turtles. So I don't know if you guys knew this, but a lot of sea turtles are actually vulnerable or endangered. And some of it does have to do with predation and habitat loss, but a lot of it's also because of human activity. So I'm sure you've seen that like there are issues with sea turtles, you know, eating plastic bags that they think are jellyfish. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I can't really digest plastic bags. So they also have a really hard time with that. But also sometimes they get caught into fishermen's nets and you would think, oh, the sea turtle can just hold its bread and crawl out. Well, there are nets that have little sea turtle holes that it could just crawl through, but 
it's not used to being in a net. It's not used to being caught up out of nowhere. So sometimes it panics and if it's usually panics too much and it can't get out, sometimes it could drown just because, you know, it's, it's just struggling to breathe and like it just releases air. So, but there are ways that you can help save them in the wild. One of them is there, if you go on a dock, sometimes on the beaches, they have fishing line recycling boots. So you can, if you're, if you're a fisherman and like you have leftover fishing line like that you're about to throw away, please don't throw it in the ocean. Try to find one of those, put it in there because turtles do sometimes get caught up in fishing lines a lot. We do have our vet team pick up turtles that get stuck in that sort of situation. And a lot of times they are able to recover, but sometimes they're in really bad condition. So it just takes a while longer for, and like it just takes a lot more work for them to get to a level where they can be released again. Another thing is to make sure that you're disposing of your plastics properly. So make sure that you don't, you know, toss away your litter, like, but also try to use single, try to avoid single use plastics because those are one of the biggest sources of marine pollution, marine plastic pollution that we see, especially plastic bags, but also things sort of like the little six pack containers, the little plastic rings and just other like other sources of plastic, like, you know, food containers, styrofoam from your takeout. If there's plastic, just try to toss it out in the garbage bin whenever you can. One thing that the Houston Zoo actually does to help save these animals in the wild that doesn't have to do with plastic, even though we do have our plastic initiatives, is the aquarium department in particular has a, is part of the seafood watch program, which means that we make sure that all of the seafood that we get to feed our animals is sustainably sourced, which means that whatever fisherman catches it and brings it over to us, it doesn't affect the natural populations in the wild. So I don't know if you guys know what overfishing is, but it's when, you know, there's a really popular type of seafood and seafood makes money, you know, so fishermen want to go out and get as much as they can to make money, but sometimes they take a bit too much and then the animals that would naturally eat in the wild can't find it anymore. So they start to starve and get hungry. So we make sure that whatever fish we take doesn't affect animals in the wild at all. So now that we're the sea turtle sort of doing its own thing, we'll move over to the cow nose rays in the next tank over. So I know there's a bit of glare and reflection on the surface of the water, but you might be able to see we have three cow nose rays in here and also two blue tangs. So these will also go into the Galapagos, Galapagos exhibit that's opening up next fall. And while we only have three in here right now, we're actually going to be getting a couple more soon. I can't tell you exactly when, but we're going to be holding it in here to make sure that we can train them properly. So that splashing that you heard is the cow nose ray sort of swimming around. Whenever we get up to the surface of their exhibit, they sort of expect food. So they just get really crazy and wild. And we've actually trained them to come up to the surface because, you know, we, it's kind of hard to reach your hand all the way down to the bottom of the tank. So they come up to the surface to targets. And right now we only have three of them. So there's three targets, which makes it a lot easier to differentiate them and make sure that they're all getting the amount that they should be getting. But surprisingly, cow nose rays are actually smarter than you think. Like, they're not as trainable as, like, you know, a dog or one of the more intelligent species, but they are able to differentiate between the targets, whether by color or shape or size. And that helps a lot with, especially once we're getting more cow nose rays in. So you might be looking in the water and thinking that it's, you know, sort of a dirty looking tank. So it's not actually dirty at all the sort of brownish greenish stuff on the bottom of the tank that's actually algae that naturally grows. And it's actually helping with the water quality a bit, but the reason why we keep the algae on the bottom as dense as it is, but like you can still see through the window because we keep that scrubbed is because we, like you might be able to, we might have the camera adjust a bit to show you a bit around the room, but we have skylights in here. And then this one of the lights is directly above the tank. So sometimes like, especially midday when we're here and feeding the animals and just working with them. The light shines directly down there. And if the bottom is just the way that we bought it, you know, just a blue reflective tank, the sunlight, it just 
gets everywhere, it makes the tank super bright, and then the Kalanos Raiders have a hard time sort of orienting themselves. It's just, they're sort of almost blinded a bit. So we keep that to help reduce the glare, and it also helps keep the tanks from getting too hot, especially in summer, even though it's just ended. So another thing about water quality is that we have to make sure that the water stays a certain level of clean because it's not like land animals where, you know, they breathe, they poop, and then we can clean it up and then take it out. But the sea animals, like the water they live in is, that's all they can live in. So they're pooping and peeing inside of their water, as gross as it sounds. So we have to make sure that, you know, we sort of minimize how much they're swimming in because they can take a, a certain amount, but once it gets too much, it starts to negatively affect their health. So we do something called a backwash, which is we take the water in a tank and then run it through the filtration system. So we just discard all the dirty water and then once that's done and it gets to a certain level that we need it to be, we just fill it up with fresh clean water that we make. And some facilities actually, they can pump water straight from the ocean, but you know, even though we are technically a coastal city, we're kind of far from the ocean. So we have something called artificial salt, which comes in bags. It's not like the table salt you use in cooking. It actually has a bunch of different minerals and things inside of it that replicate ocean water. So the animals are as comfortable as it can be. So some fun facts about Kano's rays is you can see they're sort of flat. They're not looking like regular fish or even like sharks, which they're distantly related to. So they're flat because of their lifestyle. Some of them like are sort of sweeping the bottom. That's how in an in the wild, they would normally look for food like that. They'd sort of sweep along the bottom, sift through gravel, and then when they find a piece of food, they just hover over it and suck it up. So once a, once the countless rays get close, you might be able to see there's little like ridges on the underside of its mouth. So those can actually form a little suction cup, which helps, you know, when it gets on the bottom, it closes up over it and then just sucks whatever food I'm, it finds straight into its mouth. And some of you might be thinking like, oh, like the eyes are on the top of its head and it eats food on the bottom. How is it able to even find the food? So the countless rays and a lot of animals in the ocean, they don't just rely on their sight like we do to find food. They actually use a, different, a bunch of different senses like smell and also electroreception, which is feeling the electricity in the water that, natural, that animals naturally give off. So they're able to sort of hover above the water and like sort of feel it sort of like a metal detector kind of. And then once they find something, they just sit down on it and suck it up. And they also have really strong teeth because some, what, some of what they eat is you know, things like clams or hard-shelled crabs. And I don't know if you've tried biting a crab shell, but it's really difficult. So their teeth are actually formed into little plates and they're super hard. So once they find an animal, have it in their mouth, they crush it up into like pretty much like chunks and bits and sometimes powder, and then they can just slurp it all up. So the two other fish that we have here, one you might be able to see peeking out in a little corner of the window. So that's actually called a blue tang. And we do have some of them in some of the other exhibits, like in the Natural Encounter Coral exhibit. But these we used to have in our other aquarium tank. And those will be going into the Galaba exhibit as well. So they're just a, you know, a typical saltwater tropical fish that we have in here to clean up the messes that the countless rays leave behind because they're kind of messy eaters. After they're done grinding up the food and sucking it up, sometimes some of the food that they grind up ends up coming out of their gills and you're left with little chunks and bits of water that they can't really eat. So the blue tanks help a lot with picking at that and cleaning up the tank. So I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I just like to you know, look at the animals and just watch them swim around. And it is part of our jars where we make sure to give some time to check out the animals to make sure there's no health problems or anything that we see. But also the way that they're sort of gliding on the water is very energy efficient. And that's important because these animals actually migrate sort of like the birds do. So they actually move north to south, but instead of going a typical you know, summer, winter migration, they actually moved to the south, I believe, in 
late spring or it might be late fall and then they come back up and up to the Gulf of Mexico in late spring and then just live out the summer where it's warmer. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Join us again next Wednesday at 11 a.m. on Facebook Live.